Welcome everyone to this webinar. Um, as I said a second ago, I'm Liz Stewart. I'm on the board of the Society of, for Research on Educational Effectiveness, which is uh, organizing this session. It is the second, no third, in a series of webinars we have had sort of on methods related topics. And we hope to continue, the, continue these. And so stay tuned for more. And if you have ideas on topics, um, please uh, feel free to reach out to anyone at SRI. Uh, the first was on uh, pre-registration of studies. The second was a few weeks ago on cost effectiveness. Um, and again, and now today we're thrilled to have this topic on Bayesian methods. Um, so I'll, I'll put some links to in the chat um, so you can learn a little bit more about SRI for those of you who maybe don't are less familiar with the organization. But if you're interested in evaluation topics and educational research, um, this is the place for you. Uh, so I'm glad you found us. Uh, so we'll dive into today's session. So again, um, I'm Liz Stewart. Happy to welcome you to this session on Bayesian interpretation of estimates. And I'm thrilled to have two uh, very well-qualified presenters on this topic today. Uh, we have John Deakey, um, who is a senior fellow at Mathematica with 20 years of experience designing evaluations of education interven interventions. And Mariel Finkane is a senior statistician at Mathematica who has led Bayesian analyses on evaluations um, across multiple fields, including health and education. Um, you know, it's sort of the when we thought about the topic to talk about these these two were the dream team of people to present to this audience as they really understand both the Bayesian methods and the kind of educational um, application application of those to education research. Um, just in terms of orientation, we um, are going to have presentation uh, for a little over an hour, um, maybe an hour and 10 minutes or so, and then around 1.15 uh, we'll stop and we'll have about 15 minutes for Q&A at the end. Um, you are welcome to use, um, or to, if you do have questions, please put them into the questions box. Um, actually, I see there's a couple there, I'll, and I'll, I'll be sort of moderating that as we go along, and I'll be kind of trying to triage those to save some of them for the question time at the end. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to the resources that Mariel and John are going to be providing, and um, I hope that it does prompt some really good conversation and discussion at the end. So I really do encourage you to post questions in that box. So without further ado, I'm going to um, hand it over to Mariel, and uh, you'll see me again uh, in a little over an hour to moderate the question time. So thanks very much for joining us. Thank you, Liz. So I'm actually going to take over the title slide instead of Mariel, so her voice is not actually quite like this. Um, <laughs> so happy Tuesday, everybody. Today, we're going to describe a framework that we've assembled for interpreting findings from impact of evaluation. This framework is an alternative to null hypothesis significance testing, but it's also an alternative to what many people associate with the word Bayesian, which is often a subjective definition of probability and the incorporation of prior beliefs into impact estimates. I'd like to acknowledge that today's presentation draws on a methods brief that we wrote for the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation, OPRE, as well as a training that we developed with support for the Office of Population Affairs. We are also currently working on a methods report for IES, which will go into greater depth, both conceptually and technically, than is possible in this webinar today. We thank OPRE, OPA, and IES for their interest and their support. Um, we have a lot to cover today, so as Liz mentioned, uh, we ask that you hold your questions until the end. And I turn it over to Mariel. Great. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, John. Welcome, everybody. Um, here is the plan for today. We're going to start out by telling you when we think this BC framework will be useful for you. Then uh, there's a rather long chunk of slides on why we think it's an important uh, framework to use. Then there's a section that's rather weedy on the theory of the framework, but that'll go pretty quick and we'll delve right into some very practical, hands-on examples. We'll share this spreadsheet tool that will let you go ahead and use this framework right away in your own research, we hope. Um, and we'll conclude by acknowledging some caveats. All right, so first, when is this framework going to be a useful one? So imagine that you are conducting an impact evaluation, perhaps of an educational uh, evaluation. And when, when we say impact, we mean, for example, the difference in mean outcomes between the treatment and the control group. 
and you've done a lot of the work already. You've designed the evaluation, you've collected the data, you've run the regression, and you're holding in your hand this impact estimate, right? And you're wondering what to make of it, right? Is this an impact estimate that you should get excited about? Have you finally found an intervention that's going to move the needle on these important outcomes for folks? Um, but you've heard that p-values are a flawed tool in this context, that they are perhaps not the right tool to tell you whether or not to get excited about this impact. So that's one context when this is going to come in handy. Another context, perhaps you're not conducting the impact evaluation yourself, but rather you're reading the literature and wondering what to make of some findings in the literature. And again, you've heard that p-values are not the end all be all when it comes to this interpretation of an impact estimate. All right. Okay, so we're going to start off um, talking about why you basic. And it really is about rejecting statistical significance. That was the impetus for um, us pulling this framework together. And so what's the basis for rejecting significance? Well, it started in 2016. Actually, it started a long time before that. But it really became on everybody's radar, I think, in 2016 when the American Statistical Association released a statement regarding the widespread misinterpretation of p-values and statistical significance. Um, after that, we continued to have uh, movement in this area. And in, uh, <laughs> thank you, Mary. In 2019, the American uh, statistician released a special issue, uh, Statistical Inference in the 21st Century, A World Beyond P Less Than 0.05, and then most recently, we had a commentary in Nature with over 600 signatories, um, scientists rise up against statistical significance. And I can say just from a personal perspective, um, having been using statistical significance and p-values for a pretty good number of years prior to the statement came out, I was initially a little bit skeptical. Um, I thought, ah, this is just a bunch of complaining academic statisticians making a big deal out of some persnickety little issue. Um, but over time, and given the continued attention to it, I came to appreciate that this is really an important issue. Great. So why all of these very high profile rejections of statistical significance? What is the problem with significance testing? Well, there are a number of problems. The first is that statistical significance testing really does not play nicely with uncertainty, right? It leads to this overconfidence in our conclusions where we see a p-value less than 0.05 and we think, hooray, we finally found something that moves the needle. And conversely, we see a p-value just on the other side of that rather arbitrary border and we fall into despair. So that's one problem. Another problem is this, uh, when we rely on p-values and statistical significance, we oftentimes ignore effect sizes, whereas in reality, effect sizes really matter. A very big effect with slightly more uncertainty around it might be more important than a teeny tiny effect with a statistically significant p-value. A third problem is that statistical significance creates this incentive system that really has contributed to the replication crisis, wherein even some very high profile findings have failed to, to replicate in follow up studies. And this is due to problems like publication bias, where only statistically significant results get published. Also uh, problems like p hacking and data mining on the, on the analyst side. So these three are all really big problems. And I'll just conclude by saying that they really are particularly salient and important when it comes to small studies. All of these problems, their effects are really magnified when sample sizes are small. So before we uh, talk more specifically about the misinterpretations of p-values and statistical significance, we're going to just give a quick refresher on a definition that I suspect most of you are familiar with, which is just what is a p-value. Um, and I'm going to motivate this in the context of an impact evaluation, and particularly an experimental impact evaluation where we've randomly assigned, say, students to a treatment and control group. Um, we calculate the difference in mean outcomes between the treatment and control group in our study, and we get our impact estimate. And we have a particular value for our study, and we're denoting that delta my estimate 
um, and in the figure below, we're imagining that my estimate is equal to 0.2 standard deviation. The p-value is the probability that an estimated impact greater than my estimate, the one that I'm holding in my hand, occurs by chance when the true impact delta star is zero. And so the thought experiment here is that suppose you took a group of students and you randomly assigned them to go stand in two different corners of the room and you measure their height, um, compare the difference between the two corners, and then you re-randomize over and over and over again. And we know that the two corners of the room don't change anybody's height, so the impact is zero. But as we record the difference in average height between the two groups, we'll notice it bouncing around. It'll sometimes be a little bigger than zero, sometimes a little less than zero, sometimes a lot bigger, sometimes a little bit, uh, a lot smaller. Um, and we end up with a histogram of this bouncing around impact estimate that looks like the one in the figure here. And so the p-value is just the proportion of those randomizations that would result in an estimate that is larger than our estimate when the true effect is zero. So that is what a p-value is. It, it seems a little convoluted in a way. It seems like it sounds like maybe it's pretty close to being something we'd be interested in, but <laughs> not quite. So. So I want to just briefly emphasize the last point that John made, which is that correct interpretation of a p-value is a very complicated and wordy process indeed. And attempts to interpret p-values correctly using more plain language and using pithier statements really fail. So here are two very popular misinterpretations of a p-value that are in English, right? So a p-value is not the probability that the true impact is zero because you'll recall from John's previous slide that we condition on that red impact, true impact of zero when we compute a p-value, so it can't be that. It's also not the probability that the estimated impact is attributable to randomness alone. Okay, so interpreting p-values correctly is hard. By extension, interpreting statistical significance correctly is hard as well. And on this slide, I want to compare two statements, one of which is a correct interpretation of statistical significance and the other of which is a misinterpretation. So first, the correct interpretation. It is correct to say when the true effect is zero, there is a 5% chance that an impact estimate will be statistically significant. That's correct. It's a misinterpretation to say exactly the opposite. When the impact estimate is statistically significant, there's a 5% chance that the effect is zero. So I want to make two, two quick comments on this slide. The first is about which of these statements is actually of substantive interest to us, right? And I would argue that it's the latter statement that we wish we could make, that we would actually be interested in from a decision-making perspective. And the reason is that the second statement, which is not a correct interpretation of statistical significance, that second statement is the statement about the true effect. Right? And that's, that's what we care about as researchers. That's what we're going after. What we want to know about is the true effect. And what this slide shows is that statistical significance cannot give us that information. The second issue I want to quickly point out on this slide, and we'll go into more detail on this in a moment, is that this might seem like a semantic issue where we're just moving similar phrases around and moving commas, uh, but it's not. Uh, just a semantic issue, as we'll show in a moment. It is a real, substantive, potentially large magnitude difference between these two things. So I have to admit again that uh, when the ASA first came out with this statement, I did feel like, gosh, it seems kind of like a semantic issue. Um, it does kind of seem like they're just moving words around. And I, I wanted to figure out, like, how big an issue is this? So I decided I would come up with an example uh, to help myself understand this, and I can talk at this little example um, that we're going to share with you. It's the probability that a significant impact is a false positive. And so the setup for this example is something that felt pretty familiar to me. I, I imagine that there was a federal grant fund uh, that was funding 100 locally developed programs, um, and that, that's not so far off, and CER funds a lot of uh, grants programs, as, as do other federal agencies. Um, the truth, which is unknown to the policymaker and also unknown to the researcher, is that 10 
of those programs have a meaningful impact, whatever that means, and 90 programs have no effect. So that's the truth. Now an RCT is going to be conducted because this often happens with grant uh, programs. Um, there's an evaluation component, but they don't evaluate everything. They, they pick something. And so an RCT is conducted for one of these programs, and we use a pretty standard design parameters. We're going to use statistical hypothesis testing with alpha equal 0.05, two-tailed test, and power the study is big enough that it has an 80% chance of detecting a meaningful effect. So that's the setup to this uh, example. We've got, you know, focus on the numbers. There's 100 locally developed programs. 90 have a meaningful effect. I mean, sorry, 10 have a meaningful effect. 90 have none. Alpha 0.05 and power of 80%. Great. So keep those four numbers in your head as I flip to the next slide. We're going to take each of these 100 locally developed programs and represent them as a marble in this jar. And uh, these marbles are of four different colors because they fall into four different categories. So let's talk through those categories one by one, um, thinking back to the numbers on the last slide. So the first category is the category that we'd love to end up with. These are green marbles, which represent statistically significant findings and truly effective programs. Why are there eight of them? There are eight green marbles because we have 10 truly effective programs and 80% power to detect a true effect. So 80% of 10 is eight green marbles. The two black marbles are the remaining two truly effective programs. So this is one minus power times the 10 truly effective programs. And these black marbles represent programs that are truly effective, but where we fail to detect that effect. We have a statistically insignificant um, impact finding. Okay, if we turn our attention now to the 90 truly ineffective programs, we know that alpha is 0.05, so we have a 5% chance of falsely detecting a significant uh, a significant impact, even though there's no true effect of the program. So 5% alpha times 90 truly ineffective programs is four and a half. We've rounded up to five to make our point a little stronger here. And then the remaining 85 marbles in the jar are truly ineffective programs where we do not detect a significant effect. So with those four categories, I want you guys to think through with me the math behind calculating the probability that a statistically significant impact is not real. It's a spurious finding, a false positive. So how many statistically significant impacts do we have total? That's going to be our denominator. Well, we have statistically significant impact finding in the red marbles and in the green marbles. So I'm going to put 5 plus 8 equals 13 in the denominator here. And then out of those 13 statistically significant findings, what proportion of them are not real? How many of those are spurious findings? Well, those would be our red marbles. Those are the spurious false positives. 5 over 13 is 38%. So when John first showed me this number, this was like a big gut punch to me. This tells us that in, in this example, which as John pointed out, is like a pretty reasonable example with not crazy numbers in it, right? In this example, almost 40% of the time when we see a statistically significant impact finding, it's a false positive. And just to be super clear, 38% and 5% are not the same. So even though we've conducted this well-powered study and held our alpha all the way down to 0.05, we still end up in this scenario where a statistically significant finding really is not anything to get excited about because 38% of the time it's going to be a false positive. Okay. I'm going to go on about this a little bit longer because I think it's a very important motivation for the rest of the talk. So I want to just emphasize that when we see a small p-value, we must not let ourselves shout Eureka and jump to the false conclusion that we finally have found an intervention uh, that moves the needle. And the reason, as we showed using simple math on the last slide, is that it is totally possible when we have a statistically significant effect that in truth, the underlying true effect of that program is zero. So 40% of these statistically significant impact findings were associated with true null results. So I'm going to say just, just one more time, forgive me for repeating myself over and over again, but this is the crux of the motivation behind the rest of the presentation. A small p-value 
does not imply a high probability that the thing you're evaluating works. It's, it's just uh, key values are not the tool for finding the probability that the intervention that you're evaluating actually works. So I want you to just think back now to the first slide for a moment about when we want to use the DC framework, right? I told you guys that you conducted your evaluation and done all of the hard work of getting your impact estimate into your hands, and you see a small p-value, and you're wondering whether you can get excited or not. And back on that first slide, I said that, you know, you'd heard that p-values aren't the right tool for deciding uh, whether to get excited or not. And this, I think, is really concrete uh, data about why p-values are a, a poor, poor tool for deciding when to get excited and when they're not. And in the rest of the talk, we're going to be presenting this nice alternative that will, in fact, answer that question, that really important question about which evaluation findings are worth uh, getting excited about and which are not. Okay, so the 38 was not equal to the 5. Again, what, what do we mean by that? So remember the statement that Muriel quoted earlier as a misinterpretation of statistical significance. That statement was, when the impact estimate is statistically significant, there's a 5% chance that your effect is zero, but oopsies, it's 38% in this example. So what went wrong? Why did that happen? Let's, let's, let's look into that. So first of all, we need to understand that an impact estimate is influenced by two things. It's influenced by that random mismatch between the treatment and the control group. It's also influenced by a genuine program effect. To calculate the probability that a program was genuinely effective, we need to know two things. We need to know how often random errors are large or small. We also need to know how often programs are effective or not. Statistical significance is based only on the first of those two things. In the example, we needed the prior information that I gave you on the setup slide at the very beginning that only 10% of the programs are effective in order to calculate that 38%. That is what we needed. That was the missing link to calculate that. Now, this setup, this setup of the example, it seemed intuitive to me when I developed the example, but if you think about it a little bit, there are some things about it that are unrealistic, and a, and a big thing that is unrealistic is that it assumes that interventions either have a meaningful effect or they have no effect at all, and it completely ignores this sort of murky middle where interventions could have an effect of 0.15 standard deviation, 0.05, you know, whatever. And you kind of have to wonder, is that really zero? Do we really think that's zero? Or is that noticeably different than zero? So um, that is an aspect of this example, which might seem intuitive for anyone who's grown up with the null hypothesis significance testing framework, because it dichotomizes everything into it works or it doesn't. But in the real world, it's actually kind of an unrealistic aspect of the example. So I just wanted to. Uh, call attention to that. Great. All right, so on the next slide, I want to talk a little bit more about this idea of prior information, this question of how often programs are effective and how often they're not, a type of information that traditional null hypothesis significance testing ignores. OK, and John referred to this as the missing link, this external evidence. And a big take home message for us is that an accurate understanding of the range of program effects, we're gonna call this external information or prior information, this type of information is absolutely essential if we do want to calculate the probability that a program has a positive effect or a meaningful effect. So p-values are not gonna be able to tell us this probability. If we do want to know this probability, which I think is crucial, we're gonna to need to bring in this external information. So let's look at a few examples real quick. Um, so in the jar of marbles, just 10% of programs had truly meaningful effects. Um, and we found that the probability of a significant impact being not real was 38%. However, this probability would be closer to the expected 5% if half of all the marbles in our jar corresponded to programs with meaningful effects. But at the other end of the spectrum, if nothing in the jar worked at all, then of course the probability of a significant impact being a false positive would be 
But I think as you look across these three bullets, what you should notice is that it's the proportion of meaningful effects, this external information about the range of program effects. That is the essential component to what drives the probability that a significant impact is not real. So it's really this, um, this question of how hard is it to move the needle on the outcomes that we care about? How, how many times do we try to develop interventions that end up ultimately being unsuccessful? It's that kind of the, the degree to which the field we work in is challenging that really drives how bad of a mistake we make when we misinterpret PYs in this way. And I think that's why in our field of educational research or social policy research more broadly, this is an especially important and crucial um, issue to really grapple with because we work on hard problems. We try to move outcomes and try to move needles that are really hard to move. And therefore, we end up you know, in this list of bullets somewhere probably pretty close to the top where only 10% say of programs had truly meaningful effects. So for us, p-value misinterpretation ends up being a really big deal indeed. Okay, so we started off by talking about when, and then we went on for a while about why um, we really need an alternative to p-values. And now we want to go ahead and dive into that alternative, this BCE framework. Uh, and in this section, we're first going to tell you a bit about what BCE is, and then we're going to go one by one um, through these different components of the framework. So Bayesian interpretation of estimates, this is just a framework uh, that we developed for interpreting impact estimates from impact evaluations where objectivity is highly valued. Um, there's nothing about this, or there's very little about it that is new from a theoretical or a mathematical standpoint. We're just using Bayes' rule and prior evidence to calculate the probability that an intervention was effective. Um, and so you might wonder, well, why give it a name? And it's not entirely clear that it needs a name, but we gave it a name because we thought it was important to set it apart from the much larger and sometimes controversial world of Bayesian statistics. And in particular, as I mentioned at the outset, uh, this really strong association between the word Bayesian and the idea of subjectivity is something that we thought was particularly important to try and break that association for the field of uh, evaluation, because I think objectivity is very important in this field. So just a little bit on uh, the background for this. Um, we developed BASI to help federal agencies move beyond statistical significance when interpreting findings. Um, and a big part of the origin story for this was uh, an OPRE method conference back in, gosh, maybe 2017 um, that Marial Health organized. And uh, I remember um, the head of OPRE was saying that she certainly understood uh, the problems of statistical significance. She understood that there was a misinterpretation, um, but she was very troubled by the idea of having subjective prior beliefs enter into the answer to an evaluation question. She said that in her mind, her job as an evaluator had always been to provide objective answers to research questions. It was the job of the policymakers to ask those questions, you know, does our program work? Um, and the idea that her beliefs, or or even more importantly, their beliefs, would be inserted into that impact estimate, um, you know, in a way where maybe you got an impact estimate of 0.15, and you're like, oh, well, but I really believe the program works, so let's nudge that up to 0.2. <laughs> you know, that is something that was very unappealing to her and, I, and to us, quite understandably. And so that was a big uh, reason for why we wanted to make this distinction and to kind of lay out, like, well, how do you do this correctly, uh, objectively, in the world of evaluation? Um, and so we've used BASI now in several evaluations. Um, we've used it um, in designs of new evaluations that are, are in the works. Um, but it's still early days. We'll continue to evolve um, and improve. Um, and I mentioned that we're going to have an IES methods report um, to go into more detail on concepts and technical details, and so that will help us uh, continue to move this forward. Super. So that's the origin story, and now we're going to walk through these different components of the framework one by one. 
first component, what is the research question that you can answer using BASI? So BASI can help you answer questions such as, what is the probability that the intervention worked? I'll uh, emphasize one more time that a p-value is not a tool for answering this type of question. You need, uh, a, you need a tool like BASI or something else with a Bayesian flavor. And when you use that tool, be it BASI or something else with a Bayesian flavor, you can get an answer like the one on the slide. BASI can tell you, for example, there is an 83% chance that the effect of the intervention was at least 0.2 standard deviation. Um, to recap something John said earlier, it's important to remember that this probability statement has two parts of information feeding into it. The first, which would also feed into a p-value, is just the data used to formulate the impact estimate. That's our tried and true, known and loved source of information. But what's new about BASI is that we're gonna add this second piece of information. We're gonna bring in external evidence on the impacts of relevant prior, uh, prior interventions, sorry. And I popped the marbles back up here just to remind you guys, this is external evidence such as, for example, 10% of prior relevant interventions have had meaningful effects. And importantly, to make these kind of probability statements, you need both of these pieces of information. And John's gonna show you on the next slide how we're gonna kind of stick them together to get the probability statement. All right, so this slide, we're going to walk through um, uh, kind of a, an intuitive explanation of Bayes' rule. Um, I'm going to spend a little extra time on this one relative to some of the other slides. So let's start off imagining a pristine RCT, so no attrition, no problem, no crossover, with an impact estimate of 0.2 standard deviations and a p-value of 0.05. Now, as we're looking at that impact estimate, we know that it could have been influenced by two things. One is a genuine effect of the intervention. Let's call that signal. Um, the other one would be random mismatch between the treatment and control groups, and we could call that noise. So what's more likely to be driving this impact estimate, signal or noise? To figure that out, we need to know how common big signals are, and we need to know how common uh, big noise is. The top left histogram shows us the distribution of signals. In this case, it's the distribution of effects for lots of different interventions. The bottom left histogram shows us the distribution of noise. That is, it's the distribution of impact, as, impact estimates that would occur if the true effect of the intervention we're studying is zero, and if we repeated the random assignment a large number of times, recording an impact estimate each time. So that's the thing I went through before, where I was talking about moving students to different corners in the room. So what do these two figures combined tell us? Well, they're telling us that it's kind of unusual for intervention to have an effect of at least 0.2 standard deviation. Only 16% of interventions have an effect that large. It's much less likely, though, that we'd get an estimate of 0.2 from noise alone. That's 2.5%. Using Bayes' rule to combine information about these two distributions, we can figure out things like the probability that the true effect is positive, which in this case is 96%, or the probability that the true effect is greater than 0.2, which in this case is 33%. Now, there are a couple of things I'd like to draw your attention to. Uh, the first is to note that the bottom figure is basically showing a p-value. And the problem with trying to separate signal from noise using just a p-value is that the p-value is only telling us about noise. We can't say whether a finding is more likely due to signal than noise if we don't know how common signals are. The second thing is to note that the top figure does not have to be narrowly focused on evidence regarding the intervention that are closely related to the ones we are evaluating. Instead, it could be evidence for a very large population of interventions from which we can imagine our specific intervention is drawn. So for example, it could be all available evidence on federally funded efforts to improve human well-being. Um, we could think of it as that broad. 
if we if we wanted to, and that would still be useful. We just need to be clear about this when we are interpreting these probabilities. Okay. I'll interject briefly with some Bayesian lingo for anybody who's familiar. The study findings, the green histogram, Bayesians call that the likelihood. The purple histogram, this external evidence that we're bringing in, is called the prior distribution. So you'll hear us referring to the prior a lot through with, throughout the rest of the talk. And when we say prior, think of this purple histogram where we've gone uh, to the literature and looked at a whole bunch of relevant prior interventions and uh, figured out what the uh, effects are of those interventions. That's our prior. And it's only when we combine those two that we get the blue interpretation, what, what Bayesians call the posterior distribution, this uh, probability statement about the interpretation of the effect. Anything else from you on this slide, Jen? Nope. Great. Super. All right. So component of BC framework number two is probability. And the word probability, just in English, is used in two very different ways, and we want to differentiate them for you guys here. The first way that the word probability is used is in a very objective way. When we're describing a relevant, a, I'm sorry, a relative frequency based on things that we can count on our fingers and toes. So, for example, the probability of rolling an odd number on a six-sided dice is three odd numbers, one, three, or five and six sides on the dice, so three over six, or 50%. So this is a very objective, countable type of probability. The second type is a much squishier type of probability. It's more subjective. And as John mentioned, I think a big stumbling block for Bayesian methods becoming accepted in rigorous evaluation research is that traditionally, Bayesian methods have been identified with this squishier, more subjective probability. That goes all the way back to Giffenetti and his, uh, and his colleagues, who defined probability as the intensity of personal beliefs regarding the truth of a proposition. So John and I want to be crystal clear that when we talk about probability, we're using this first objective um, definition uh, based on things that we can count. And we think that our own personal beliefs really have no, no place in our evaluation work. All right, so now we're going to talk a little bit about the prior, which is another source of controversy in Bayesian methods, but we hope to make it a little less controversial by taking the boost out of it. Um, so for Bayesian, we provide some guidelines, suggestions, if you will, for picking prior evidence. Uh, the first one we've said a million times, but a million and one, we'll say it again, is it's prior evidence, not prior beliefs. Um, second, Oh, and, and I would say just in terms of evidence, uh, to make it even stronger, um, we would tend to like to look at vetted evidence, like good evidence. Um, and so one nice thing in the field of education is that we have the What Works Clearinghouse, which provides um, a database of evidence that has met evidence standards. So uh, everything that we've been talking about today sort of assumes that the only things that influence and impact us a bit are randomness or a genuine effect. We haven't talked about uh, bias or selection bias or other sorts of bias. So we're assuming this is you know, pretty good evidence. Um, so it's based on evidence, not prior belief. And when we set our beliefs aside and we focus on evidence, there can actually be some, some benefits of that. I, I don't know if this is just me, but I often have a hard time figuring out what my beliefs are. If you were to ask me what my beliefs are today, it might be different than tomorrow. Um, research assistants at Mathematica know that what I believe is the right way to specify a regression today may not be what I tell them in a month. Um, so beliefs are kind of hard to nail down, but evidence, you can kind of depersonalize it. It doesn't have to be about me, it's just about the evidence. And, and this ends up being helpful, uh, maybe more than you might realize. Um, one thing that uh, I think is really maybe a little counterintuitive at first, but, but I think it's also important to understand is that too broad is likely better than too narrow. Um, so it's better to cast a wide net uh, in, in the prior evidence. You know, earlier I said all federal efforts to improve well-being, it would be better to go too broad than too narrow. And the reason for that is that the evidence, it, these things are still estimates. 
so they, they're not perfect. It's not true. It's not like an example where we knew for sure that 10% of things were, had meaningful effects. And so if we have a small set of evidence, it could be noisy or unstable. Um, and then also it could create the impression of cherry picking. You know, what, what have you excluded um, if you have this tiny base of evidence? So um, at least as a sensitivity analysis, having a wide net uh, for the prior evidence is something that we would recommend. If you end up with a prior evidence base where the mean effect size is really far from zero, um, you might want to question that. You might want to go back and check again. Uh, our experience has been that, as Muriel mentioned, moving the needle on outcomes in the social policy world is challenging. It's, it's hard. Um, it, it can be done. It is done sometimes. But it's usually small effects. Uh, big effects are rare. So if you end up with a prior evidence base centered far away from zero, that could be a red flag. Um, and then finally, uh, I don't know if it's a guideline or sort of a frame of mind that we recommend is that um, if we make the infeasible perfect, the enemy of the feasible good, then the worst can win. So misinterpreting statistical significance can lead to a really big mistake. Um, picking the prior for helping us to interpret evidence can feel kind of uncomfortable because there are different choices that you could make, and those choices could nudge the answer around a little bit, and that could feel uncomfortable. Um, but it's better to use, in most cases, it's better to use a prior following these suggestions than it is to misinterpret statistical significance. So don't allow perfectionism to prevent you from making progress. Great, so let's keep those guidelines in mind and think a little more concretely about how we might define a prior distribution. So let's consider first the easy case where all of the estimates in the literature that we're drawing from for, our, for developing our prior are perfect. So if they were perfect and had standard errors of zero, all of them, then uh, specifying the prior would be very easy. We would go to the literature, we'd get this big collection of perfect estimates, we calculate the average of that collection, and we could call that number mu. Then we calculate the variance across all of them. Some have very big effects, some have very small effects. Most of them have effects near zero. That variance we would call sigma squared. And then those two numbers, mu and sigma squared, would define a normal distribution that we could use as our prior. So that's the easy case. The hard case is unfortunately the case that describes the world that we live in, because in this literature that we're going to go to, for example, the What Works Clearinghouse, the prior estimates are just estimates. They're not perfect. And therefore, we have to make some adjustments when we're developing our prior. So now, instead of having a normal mu sigma squared prior, we're going to have a prior that we're going to call normal mu adjusted sigma squared adjusted. And there's kind of three components to this adjustment. First, we're going to give more weight to the bigger studies. Second, we're going to adjust for clustering of findings within studies. And third, very importantly, we're going to make an adjustment for reporting bias in the literature, which is also called file drawer bias or key hacking, to try to account for the fact that what we're seeing in the literature might be a somewhat overly optimistic view of how hard it actually is to move the needle, say, uh, for educational outcomes. So John developed a very cool um, kind of data-driven way to identify the degree to which this file drawer bias is a problem and then to correct for it. So when we make those three adjustments, we're going to end up with this adjusted prior. And John's going to show you on the next slide how that actually uh, works out in practice. OK, so here is an example from uh, a meta-analysis we did of all the evidence in the What Works Clearinghouse database that meets standards with or without reservations. So these are either um, RCTs well implemented or high quality quasi and we've got 306 uh, interventions, over 2,000 estimates of effect. Um, and if we just calculate the raw unadjusted effect size, the raw unadjusted standard deviation of those effect sizes, completely ignoring precision or anything else, um, we would get a mean effect size of 0.22 and a standard deviation of 0.42. So, um, it's all an effect size unit, so it's a pretty noticeably non-zero average there. Um, but when we apply the adjustments, so when we give greater weight 
to more precise estimates and when we make an adjustment for um, bias due to the file drawer problem. And I'll just say a quick word about what adjustment we use. So um, when you hear the file drawer problem, the file drawer problem is the idea that uh, a researcher conducts, uh, calculates a lot of impact estimates and they put everything but the most favorable impact estimate in a file drawer. And so what that means essentially is that if that's true, what we see in the literature um, is a bunch of people reporting maximum order statistics. So the literature is filled with maximum order statistics. Um, and there's a neat uh, approximation of a maximum order statistic that is just a linear function of the standard error. So if you run a regression of impact estimate on standard error, if there's a non-zero coefficient on the standard error, and if it's positive, that means, or that implies, that there are things sitting in the file drawer in the literature. Basically, there's a, a positive correlation between impact estimates and standard errors. Um, and so we break that correlation in this meta-analysis. And when we break that correlation, we end up with an average effect size of 0.04, not 0.22. And then when we also um, give greater weight to the more precisely estimated effect, the standard deviation of the genuine effect sizes is 0.23 rather than 0.42. So these adjustments uh, really do make a difference, but we think that they make sense to do them and they put us um, in a place that is intuitively more sensible, which is closer to a zero average effect, but still slightly positive. And, and I would like to point out that this prior distribution, centered at 0.04 with a standard deviation of 0.23, this is not saying that interventions never work. It's not saying that at all. Um, in fact, there are, are definitely interventions that work, is, is what this prior distribution is saying. Um, it's just that on average, the effects tend to be small. Um, and I, I think that's it seems intuitive to me, having worked on these things for a while. Super. I'll just interject here briefly and say that in a moment we're going to live demo this spreadsheet tool that John developed for actually applying this basic framework to your evaluations. And in that spreadsheet, this adjusted prior that's on the slide here in yellow with a mean of 0.04 and a standard deviation of 0.23 is the kind of default prior. So it um, when you see that prior in a moment in the spreadsheet, you can think back to this slide and really know where it came from, which uh, intervention or how many interventions were included, what adjustments were made, and so forth. This is the methodology that underlies the default prior in the spreadsheet tool. That's a good flag, Mariel. Thank you. And uh, I guess <laughs> I would point. I guess I would point out another thing uh, as well, which is that this is sort of an example of that idea of uh, don't let the uh, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, you know, this meta-analysis here was based on findings from the Clearinghouse back in 2018. That's when we downloaded the data. Um, and of course, that's going to change over time. And so uh, every once in a while, we're going to be inclined to run that analysis again. And these numbers could shift around a bit, you know. And, and different people might have different ideas about exactly how to conduct that analysis. Some people might think, oh, we think you're being too conservative with that file board adjustment, we think it should be done this way, or and, and that's all fine, that's, you know, totally reasonable, and we can just uh, assess the sensitivity our, of our findings to those different choices. Um, you know, the fact that you have those different choices might feel uncomfortable, but that, that's kind of like, that's the reality, you know, the reality is we don't know with certainty um, what the distribution of prior evidence is, but it's not going to move around a lot. Um, and you'll find that if you have a reasonably well-powered study, your findings aren't going to be too sensitive, too, too sensitive to these types of small methodological choices about uh, analyzing the prior. So, take we take the Now, uh, this is just a tiny bit random, but um, we thought it was important to make this point rather explicitly. Um, there's a thing in Bayesian analysis um, called the flat prior, and the flat prior essentially assumes that impacts of all magnitudes are equally likely, that an impact of negative infinity is just as likely as an impact of zero, which is just as likely as an impact of positive infinity. And if you define 
probability, and if you define priors in terms of beliefs, you can kind of see how this might be appealing because it is an attempt at agnosticism. It's an attempt at being objective. Um, it's, an att it's basically saying, could the effect be zero? Could it be 0.5? Could it be 100? I don't know. I don't have it. I don't know anything. Like, I'm just completely ignorant, totally agnostic. My, I, my, I have no beliefs. Could be anything. Um, when you define probability and priors as beliefs, it seems maybe tempting. It seems like this could be a good way to go. And in fact, people have often used this approach and have called it objective, um, an objective approach to Bayesian analysis. But if you reject belief and you focus on evidence as the basis of the prior, then you see that this is ridiculous. There's no evidence that impacts of positive infinity are just as likely as zero or just as likely as negative. It's actually kind of nuts. Um, and, and the thing that's, that's really kind of funny is if you use the flat prior um, in a simple model of the, of the type that we've explicitly been using here, <laughs> what ends up being the case is that your posterior probability is exactly the same as a p-value calculated from a one-sided test. Um, and so you can go through all of this machinations. You can, you know, go to the trouble of using this different approach to doing your analysis and computing the posterior probabilities, but you end up with exactly the same number. And so this whole point, this whole process would be pointless if you're used to flat prior. Um, it would just be like a, an employment program for statisticians. Um, no offense, Mariel. <laughs> but um, if, so, so we reject the flat prior because it's not based on evidence, and it just regurgitates p values. So we we wanted to say that very explicitly, even though it's just a tiny bit random. Super. Great. So as John was mentioning two slides back. No single prior in and of itself might seem entirely credible. It's going to be challenging to get all of your stakeholders on board and agree on precisely which set of studies and which set of findings from those studies should go into your prior. So as John was saying, we think sensitivity analysis is really important here. We think you should show how your posterior probabilities, how your you know, final conclusions and interpretations, how sensitive they are to the selection of prior evidence. And one really nice thing is that you'll find that especially with well-powered studies, we really don't see much sensitivity, uh, you know, when we compare among reasonable, well-intentioned, uh, well-intentioned priors. The spreadsheet tool that I keep pointing forward to is going to bake this in for you. So it's going to just by default give you uh, different posterior probability statements, different interpretations for different priors that you might have uh, have considered. So this will be nice and easy from a practical perspective. All right, the next component of the framework is the impact estimate that we're going to report, uh, say, in, in the abstract or in the, in the manuscript that you're working on. And there are two different estimates that you could consider. The first is the traditional estimate. This could be, for example, a difference in means between treatment and control, and that's based only on study uh, data that you've collected and analyzed. Another possibility would, re would be to report a Bayesian, or what's sometimes called a shrunken estimate. And this Bayesian estimate is a weighted average between that first guy, the traditional estimate, and the mean of the prior evidence base that you're using. John and I think that both of these are really important um, for different reasons, so that you should really include both in your report but, or in your manuscript. But when you're choosing which to highlight in your abstract, say, which one to really emphasize, that's going to depend on how relevant the prior evidence that you've uh, collected is for you. We recommend furthermore that you decide what you're going to emphasize, so decide how relevant your prior evidence is before you see the findings, of course, and not afterwards. So while we uh, definitely recommend reporting both of these types of impact estimates, when it comes to interpretation of those impact estimates, uh, we think that, at least for the purposes of the Bayesian framework, um, posterior probabilities are the only way to go. Um, I'll make a practical note that I recognize that perhaps for quite some time, 
it will be necessary to report p-values and statistical significance just because a lot of people expect them and to not have them could be jarring for some audiences. Um, and so we're not saying that you can't report statistical significance, but it's just not part of this framework. So for the purposes of this framework, the only interpretation of estimates comes from the posterior probability. Now, we think it's important to clarify that these probabilities have a specific meaning, especially since we're not basing it on beliefs. You know, if you base it on beliefs, then they could mean whatever you want. But um, because we're basing it on countable things, um, we have to be clear about what these things mean and what they don't. So these probabilities, they apply to the effect of the evaluated intervention on the sample included in your study or the study that you're looking at. Um, they are not statements about the chances of the intervention having an effect in the future. These aren't predictive statements. You know, remember, this is about separating signal from noise in the context of a specific study. So it's not about generalizability, it's not about prediction. Um, and they can only be interpreted in the context of the prior. So what I mean by that is, you know, we suggested that you should go or, or you should feel fine going very broad and saying that, um, you know, relative to all the interventions that have been uh, implemented by the federal government to improve welfare, uh, you know, what proportion of those had a positive effect? What's the probability that my intervention is among those that have a meaningful effect? When you say among those, you just need to be clear what you're talking about. Are you talking about all interventions funded by the federal government? Are you talking about all interventions in the What Works Clearinghouse database? Are you talking about all interventions in the clearinghouse database that affected reading scores, you know, so you just need to be clear what this population is that you're referring to. Great. So those are some helpful guidelines for interpreting these things correctly. We want to give you just a quick example of what that looks like in practice. So here is a nice, correct interpretation of a Bayesian posterior probability statement. We can say, for example, we estimate a 75% probability that our intervention increased reading test scores by at least 0.15 standard deviations, given our estimate and prior evidence on the impacts of educational interventions. So this is one sentence, but it has a lot going on in it. And in particular, it adheres, it adheres to the guidelines that John just laid out. So importantly, the verb in the uh, sentence is past tense, our intervention increased reading test scores. So we're being very clear that this is about the effect of the intervention as it was evaluated. This is not a predictive statement about how likely it is to work tomorrow in your classroom. Um, another nice thing about this statement is that it really kind of bakes into the statement of the posterior probability all of the pieces of information that are feeding that probability. So in blue, we have the posterior or the interpretation. In red, we nod to our study data. That's one important piece that feeds the blue. And then in green, we acknowledge the other crucial piece of information that is required to make the blue probability statement, and that is uh, external evidence, prior evidence on impacts of educational intervention. All right, congratulations. You have made it through the the WeD theory section, and we're now going to demo this spreadsheet tool for you and hopefully get nice and practical and show you how to do this in your own work. So, John, let me see if I can turn this over to you. All right. Oh, it looks like I have the power. Okay, do you see the spreadsheet mirror? Actually. Great. All right, so uh, we developed this little spreadsheet tool um, as part of a training that we did that was funded by OPA. Uh, and it's a pretty simple tool in terms of the math. We're just using a conjugate prior normal normal formula for people who know what that means. Um, and so it's the kind of thing that can be easily implemented in an Excel spreadsheet. But we thought it would be, you know, nice for folks to have a spreadsheet. Um, you could also do this in R or any programming language you like. But I'll just walk through this spreadsheet. So um, on this tab, we have prior evidence, and we have some pre-baked priors. One thing that this spreadsheet cannot do is the spreadsheet cannot do a complicated meta-analysis to turn your collection of prior studies into a prior distribution. That goes beyond the 
what this spreadsheet can do. So this can only use pre-baked priors. Um, but you could unlock the spreadsheet and enter in your own priors if you want, uh, just for fun, but we would hope that you follow uh, good practice and inform those. But so we've got a couple of pre-baked priors in here. The first is the what we're clearing house uh, database, um, and this is what Mariel uh, gave you a heads up would be coming in the spreadsheet. It's centered at 0.04 and has a standard deviation 0.23. Um, and then we have some columns where we just try to help you develop some intuition for what this prior distribution really means. So we show, well, with that prior distribution, what does that mean in terms of the proportion of prior intervention impacts that are, say, less than minus 0.2 or less than um, minus 0.1, etc. cetera. Um, it's, it's showing, uh, it's giving you sort of a feel for where intervention effects lie. Um, so that's the prior evidence tab. We can go over to the study findings tab, and this is where you could enter uh, your particular finding. So an impact estimate of 0.10, a standard error of 0.08. Um, we could imagine that that came out of a study. It's important that everything be standardized so that everything is an effect size unit. Um, that's an important uh, caveat on this tool. Um, now we go over to the interpretation pane, which pulls together the prior, it pulls in with the impact estimates, and then you're able to specify the posterior probabilities that you're interested in. So for example, on this first row, uh, there's this little pop-up, and I can choose what uh, source of evidence I want to use, and so I'm using the Wetworth Clearinghouse, and then that populates the mean and standard deviation, then you can come over here and set up this pop-up, and you can enter um, the particular impact estimate that you had entered from the previous uh, slide, and then uh, it pulls that in. It calculates that shrunken impact estimate that Mariel referred to, so we recommend reporting both the data-based, but also traditional data-based impact estimate, but also the shrunken estimate. And then here, you can um, specify the posterior probability you're interested in. So I can say, I want the probability that the true effect is greater than, and then you can enter a value here like zero, or I could change it to say 0.10, um, and then it calculates that posterior probability. So I can change it to 0.15, you know, zero, whatever I would like it to be. Um, and then on this last uh, page, we have some notes and references. Um, so that's the little tool that we concocted, um, and what we envision this hopefully being helpful for is if you're interpreting findings from the extant literature and you see a, an impact estimate, a standard error, and a p-value, and you're wondering, well, this is statistically significant or it's not statistically significant, but I just learned that statistical significance isn't very useful, so how do I <laughs> interpret this? What's the probability that this intervention works? Um, our hope would be that this might be a handy tool uh, to get a better sense of the probability that the darn thing actually works. Um, and so we're providing that. Uh, I'm not quite sure the technology of how that will be provided, but it's a handout here in the thing, and I'm guessing Alan will make it available. So let's see, Mayor, I'm going to try to kick this back over to you. You see the slides again? Yep, sure can. That worked really well. So, John, I realized that in my excitement for you to share the tool, I actually skipped this slide, which I think you intended to talk about beforehand. Do you want to still talk about it now? Oh, sure. Um, well, let's see. Um, yeah, so I, th I think we've covered this. It, it's basically the idea that the, uh, the priors in the spreadsheet, those are pre-baked, and if you want to make your own prior distribution, you need to do uh, a more complicated meta-analysis, which is sadly beyond the scope of our time here together today. Great. Super. So our next plan is to show you some examples, walk through some examples step-by-step step of this uh, use context that John was just describing, where you have an impact estimate and a standard error and a p-value, and you're wondering what to make of it. And we're going to help you interpret those pieces of evidence using uh, Bayesian posterior probabilities 
that it would be very e easy to calculate with this tool that John just showed. So here are some examples. All righty, so here's the first example. And we're giving these examples from the perspective of somebody who's trying to interpret uh, evidence um, in order to potentially inform a decision. So in this case, uh, we're looking at study findings for intervention A and study findings for intervention B. This is coming from different studies. In this case, both the impact estimates are positive and both have a p-value of 0.05. So they're statistically significant, but is there any difference between these two things? They're statistically significant, so according to the old way of thinking about things, Eureka, they both work. Um, but we want to implement the intervention that was most likely to have had a positive effect. Um, in other words, the one least likely to do harm. Um, if we were to plug this information into that spreadsheet tool, which we have done, uh, which intervention should we implement? And it turns out that even though they're both statistically significant, there's actually a difference in the probability that the true effect is greater than zero. It turns out that intervention B uh, is the one that is less likely to do harm. There's a 98% chance that its true effect was uh, greater than zero, whereas intervention A, there's only a 95% chance. Now, why is that? Given that we're using the same prior, okay, we're using the same prior distribution in both these calculations, and the p-value is exactly the same. Well, the reason for the difference is that standard error. Uh, the standard error for the first finding was much larger than the standard error for the second finding. Um, and so in order for that to be statistical significant, statistically significant, the impact estimate had to be much, much larger. But that huge impact estimate isn't really very compatible with the prior distribution. The prior distribution says that's pretty unlikely. Um, and so, uh, that's a, an intuitive explanation for why, even though you have the well, I hope it's intuitive. Even though you have <laughs> the same prior and the same key value, the posterior probability can be different, and it's because of the standard error difference. Uh, this also gets back to something Mariel said earlier about how the problem of p-value misinterpretation is particularly bad in small studies. Um, this larger standard error would correspond to a smaller study. Cool. I, I really love this example. I think it really shows that you've got your big estimate from, stand, uh, from study A, and you've got your small p-value from study A, and it would be so easy to just conclude that that means that study A is likely to have, or is, is most likely to have a positive effect. But that turns out not to be the case. You really need to bring in this external evidence using the tool and calculate that probability um, in a more formal way. And then you can find out that, in fact, B, B looks better. Very cool, I think. All right, so let's do another one. Let's take this same pair of impact estimates, same pair of standard errors, same pair of p-values, but change our decision criteria for deciding which study, uh, sorry, which intervention to implement. In particular, let's now decide to implement the intervention that's most likely to have a meaningful effect, greater than 0 0.1 standard deviations. Which intervention should we implement now? Now, actually, the story flips, and we should implement intervention A, which has an 83% chance of having a true effect greater than 0.1 standard deviations, compared to just a 48% chance for intervention B. So the, the idea here is that intervention A is a little bit of a riskier bet. It could do harm, um, but that B is, is, um, is kind of the, the safer bet. Um, so again, let's think about the intuition here. How is it that B has such a small probability of having a meaningful effect, even though it actually had the larger probability of having a positive effect. How did that happen? Um, well, what happened is that intervention, intervention B's standard error of 0.05 is pretty small. So it's really precluding very large effects of the intervention. And then we put on top of that small standard error this prior, which is pretty skeptical of very large effects. And with those two forces combined, we end up with only a 48% chance of a meaningful effect. For intervention B and intervention A ends up winning the day. Anything on this one, John, or shall I flip? Yeah, that's good. All right. All right, so this is another one that I, I think is kind of fun. So here we've got intervention A and B yet again um, facing off. And 
In this case, intervention A has a p-value less than 0.05, so it crossed that bright line to statistical significance, whereas P intervention B, you know, so close, but, but no cigar. Intervention B, it doesn't work because the p-value is 0.06. Um, and so if interpreting these two findings, intervention A works, intervention B doesn't work because it's not statistically significant. But actually, which one of these should we implement if we can't pay attention to the probability of a positive effect? We can go to the next slide. It turns out that intervention B, even though it's not statistically significant, has a higher probability of having a positive effect. Not much higher probability, but it is a little bit higher. And the thing that I think is particularly striking is that under the null hypothesis significance testing framework, we would have made this very dichotomous, abrupt, you know, big <laughs> difference in conclusions where we would have said it doesn't work. Its effect is zero, you know, and that's just not the case. Um, it's actually a little bit more likely to have a positive effect than that thing to the point of three. And again, a big thing to differentiate these two is that standard error. And so this is another example of how uh, small studies are particularly prone to the hazards of p-value interpretation. And then we got one more example. One more example, and this time we're gonna hold the standard error constant. So we're really comparing apples to apples across intervention A and B. So in both cases, we have a standard error of 0.1. But in intervention A, we have a larger impact estimate of 0.3 compared to uh, intervention B's impact estimate of 0.2. This results in a smaller p-value for intervention A, larger p-value for intervention B, both of which are statistically significant. And we wonder again, which of these two is most likely to have a positive effect? So in this case, uh, for the first time, our kind of p-value-based intuition actually does check out. So in this case, we see a higher probability of a true effect greater than zero for the intervention with a smaller p-value. And um, the reason that in this case, the p-value based intuition does work out is because the standard errors are equal in these two cases. So um, when we have the same standard error in both interventions and we're using the same prior to interpret both interventions, that in that case, this comparison of p-values does end up providing um, more meaningful Great. Yeah, so that's the last of these. Oh, go ahead, John. Oh, I was just going to say. I think I think it is nice to show this one, you know, because um, it does sometimes happen that you could be in a context where everything else is held constant. So if you hold constant mm -hmm. prior and you hold constant the standard error, and if you're just making comparisons uh, based on p values in that case, then a smaller p value genuinely does correspond to a more credible effect. Um, and so there, that is a context where that can work out. Um, but <laughs> it's a little unusual to actually be in that context. Even within the same study, you're going to have standard errors moving around. So, uh, uh, yeah. Anyway, sorry, Eric, go ahead. No, great point. Totally right. So I hope these were useful uh, examples for generating some intuition behind how these probabilities really can meaningfully differ from the conclusions you would uh, reach based on p-values. And I'll just emphasize one more time that calculating them is really easy with the tool. So you have, you input into the tool information from these first three columns and the tool will kick out the fourth column for you. All right, last section of the outline is to talk about some problems that Basie cannot fix. All right, so um, BASI is nice for helping us to separate signal from noise in the context of well-conducted evaluation, but it is not a magic bullet that solves all problems. So for example, if it is not a well-conducted evaluation, if it's something that has um, you know, a, a selection bias problem, it's not an RCP, uh, then BASI can't help you with that. Um, uh, it also doesn't magically solve data problems. If you have an RCT with a high attrition rate, or if you have measurement error in your variables, or if you have 
uh, you know, construct validity problems with your measures, basis that can solve that. Um, estimation, um, you know, if you're doing an RDD analysis and you have problems with functional form uh, misspecification, Basie is not going to solve that. Um, if you forget to cluster your standard errors, Basie depends on your standard error being right. So if, if it's not right, then Basie is going to mess up. Um, multiple comparisons. You know, in a in a more complicated Bayesian analysis with like a hierarchical model, um, that type of analysis can help with multiple comparisons. It's a little tricky, but it can. Um, if you're using the Bayesian spreadsheet tool, then it's not going to help with multiple comparisons, or at least not much. It it can help in a subtle way, but but it 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 doesn't know that how many things you're looking at, and it's not making any adjustments for it. So that's to be aware of. Um, we also cannot uh, protect against bad incentives in research culture. Um, you know, there's a bad incentive associated with publication bias and statistical significance, but it's entirely possible that there could be new publication bias. If editors decide to use a cutoff on a posterior probability as the basis for publication as opposed to a cutoff on a key value, then that can create bad incentives as well. So uh, we can't, uh, basically can't uh, solve problems of humans. Um, and then finally, we made this point before, but it's really worth emphasizing, which is that the probabilities we're describing here are not predictions about the future. And it's easy to get confused about that because probabilities are often presented in the context of making predictions about the future. There's a 30% chance it's going to rain tomorrow, for example. Um, but these are our probabilities focused on the task of separating signal from noise in the context of past study. So it's the probability that something happened past tense, not the probability that something will happen in the future. Um, and so that's important to understand. Now, Having said that, it's not impossible to make predictive probabilities, but it's a more complicated modeling uh, exercise that also requires more data and then beyond the scope of our conversation today. Also, we should acknowledge that p-values are also retrospective. So this isn't a unique oh, yeah. challenge of BASE. That's a very good point. That's a really great point. <laughs> Super. All right, great. So. To wrap up what we've said today, um, first, BASI is a tool that's going to give you an answer to the question that I think you probably actually care about. What is the probability that this intervention truly had a meaningful effect? This is a question, as we've emphasized, that p-values cannot answer. Furthermore, we can answer this question not using squishy personal belief. You may have had uh, uh, thoughts coming in that Bayesian methods were squishy, but BASI is not squishy. It is uh, based on nice, cold, hard evidence. Third, I want to uh, reference again John's idea that we shouldn't let the infeasible, perfect prior that has every study you could possibly imagine wanting to include in your prior, we shouldn't let that infeasible, perfect be the enemy of this feasible, good WWC prior um, that we are going to put in your hands with this spreadsheet tool. Because if we do so, the worst could win, and we'll end up uh, with p-values and all their warts. So go ahead and do the, the feasible good thing. Uh, encouragingly, you're not going to see a lot of uh, sensitivity to making you know ballpark reasonable different decisions about which studies to include and exclude and how to do these adjustments especially if your um, impact estimates are precisely estimated and lastly the spreadsheet tool makes these methods which have traditionally been uh, pretty challenging to implement just from a computational perspective um, it makes them nice and and easy to, to implement um, and to interpret these findings from the literature so I'll conclude by sharing some uh, references. You'll see on this slide that we're really heavily uh, influenced and inspired by Andrew Gelman, who's at Columbia. Here's a quote from him really um, backing up this point that the flat prior is, is out and that bringing in real subject matter relevant um, prior information is, 
is the way to go. This is really a move, not just on mine and John's part, but in the broader, in the broader field. And I'll conclude by thanking you guys so much and uh, sharing our contact information. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, Liz, could I ask you to take over for, for Q&A facilitation? Yes, happy to do that. Thank you so much. I, I think I'm now also convinced that all of our webinars should have two presenters because uh, it was so nice to have <laughs> the two of you be able to uh, interact with each other and make it uh, a nice and, and informative and engaging session. So thank you. Well, thank you very um, much. We have a few minutes for questions. Um, I'll try to highlight some of them. And then um, any of you who maybe didn't have a question, Mariel and John nicely gave their emails, so you can always follow up separately. Um, so there's sort of two main categories that I want to try to tackle in our five minutes. So we have, and of course, not surprisingly, the big one is sort of the prior, choice of prior. And there's quite a few questions on this point with different sort of aspects, sort of where should the data come from? Should you consider a range of priors? Some of that I think you ended up addressing sort of as the presentation went on. But maybe I'll just summarize one of them from Ji Yoon Kim said, what are your thoughts on publication bias and quality robustness of prior information? And sort of maybe you could just expand on that a little. And then sort of relatedly was um, sort of Betsy Wolf, I'll kind of pull out one of hers, which was sort of how much should you can be concerned about other factors like the type of outcome or maybe the type of intervention um, affecting prior. So if you could just muse a little bit more on <laughs> those sorts of um, topics, that would be great. You want to start, Mary? Sure. Um, these are great questions. This is definitely where the rubber meets the road. This is why it's this is why it's tricky and not automatic to do this. Um, so thank you for your thoughtful questions. I really appreciate them. Um, so let's see. The two specific things were issues with the quality of the evidence. And she's I'm always for, already forgetting the second, but maybe I'll tackle the first and then give the second to John because hopefully he can still remember it. Um, so quality of the evidence, I think that's a really great question. And there's definitely this problem of garbage in, garbage out. If your uh, prior is based on low quality um, evidence, then you're not going to um, get meaningful probability statements out the other end for sure. Um, so I think there are kind of two ways that I can think of to, to kind of help ameliorate this concern, and maybe John will have others. One is to, when you're selecting prior evidence, to really uh, restrict to high quality evidence. So in the prior that John uh, shared in his spreadsheet, he's restricted to WWC findings that met the evidence standards. So that's, that's one approach, for example. If you were doing your own literature review, you could um, you know, apply similar uh, filters where you only look at for example, randomized control trials or only include quasi-experimental designs that were very well conducted, for example. So that's one possibility. And then I think another possibility is to let the evidence that ends up in your prior evidence base be informative, kind of tell on itself almost. As John was saying, when we observe in our evidence base a relationship between impact estimates and standard errors, that is evidence of the file drawer bias right there uh, in front of us. So some of these problems are almost self-correcting in that they, they, they tell on themselves and then you can use that association to kind of, uh, to make the correction. John, anything to add there? Sure. Um, you know, I, I heard a couple of other things. I heard, I think it was asking about, um, you know, publication bias and there's another way to get at that, which is that the clearinghouse doesn't rely, you know, something like the clearinghouse is nice because it doesn't rely just on published um, findings. It also goes after dissertations in the gray literature. And so uh, that's one way to get it. You know, there's there's a statistical way to handle it, but then there's also just try to get better data uh, as the way to handle it. Better data always beats uh, statistical adjustments. So that's one aspect of it. And then I think I heard a question about um, I don't know if I remember this exactly right, but I think it was asking something about different types of outcomes, uh, different mm -hmm. types of intervention. Right, right. And so I think that's a really good question, too. And this gets at a concept called exchangeability, where if you have evidence that there are subsets of intervention that have different effects, then it is productive to take that into account in forming your prior distribution. So if you look across the findings in the clearinghouse, and you find that interventions tend to have larger effects 
on reading test scores than on math test scores, and if you're interested in impact on reading test scores, then it absolutely makes sense to interpret it relative to the population of interventions trying to affect reading test scores. Um, you can interpret it more broadly than that as well. You just need to be clear about the interpretation. Um, now, uh, a question that I think would be a follow-up to that is like, what if my study is looking at an outcome that is an educational outcome, but it's not in the clearinghouse? Like, what if I'm looking at impacts on music theory? You know, I'm looking at the impacts on test scores of music theory, and there aren't a lot of music theory um, interventions in the clearinghouse. What do I do? Um, and that's a great question. And uh, that there, and I'll give you a couple. I'll give you a. Uh, I'll attack it from multiple angles. So one angle we're going to attack it from is to say that that's one reason why we recommend reporting both the traditional impact estimate that's based only on your study data and then also the shrunken impact estimate because sometimes the prior evidence that's available doesn't really feel as relevant to your study. And so it would seem counterintuitive and awkward to say that the impact estimate of this intervention trying to improve knowledge of music theory is like a weighted average of the only data on music theory plus all this other stuff. It doesn't have anything to do with music theory. So it might seem more intuitive uh, to focus on the traditional impact estimate in that case. But when we go to try to understand, well, what's the probability that you really did move the needle on music theory? The best we can do is to say, well, how often do you move the needle on any educational outcome? I mean, if we knew the music theory thing, then great, that would be a great thing to do. But rather than just throwing up our hands and saying, oh, I don't know, um, I, can't, I can't answer this question about what's the probability that this thing had a positive effect, or doing the really horrible thing of saying that minus infinity and positive infinity and zero are all equally likely, which we know is ridiculous, um, going toward this broader evidence base that incorporates all these other outcomes and classes of intervention is still a useful way to try to get a sense for the probability that this thing moves the needle. Um, so that's, uh, th those are the questions I heard. Did we miss anything, Liz? No, that was perfect. Um, it's 1.30, but maybe I will quickly, if you give, if like a 20 second response to this one. So someone had, uh, Neha Nanda had asked two things about quasi-experimental studies and actually Mariel already answered one of them, which is that you could use priors based on quasi-non-experimental designs, though you might want to be careful about their quality, as you said. But then the question that maybe again, I'll just like 30 second response, um, can Bayes-E be used on quasi-experimental designs? Oh, sure. I mean, absolutely. Um, it, it absolutely can. It's just, you know, you're making the same assumptions about the validity of the designs that you would be making when you interpret the findings using key values or statistical significance. So you're going to say, conditional on the assumption that the QED worked, um, that we have equivalence with respect to unobservables, um, this is the interpretation. So it's, it's always going to be interpretation conditional on assumptions and conditional on your model. Mariel, do you have uh, any extra thoughts on that? Maybe just in the remaining two seconds, I'll point forward to some future work from me and John that's actually focused on developing a prior that incorporates the possibility of bias due to a quasi-experimental design. We're really excited about that. That does sound exciting. <laughs> right up my alley, <laughs> for sure. So great, maybe we'll have you come back in six months or whatever and uh, tell us more <laughs> about that. Um, Thank you so much. This has been um, very helpful. I hope that the attendees learned as much as I did, uh, even as someone who, who, you know, kind of, I do have some Bayesian background, but this is a really great overview and wonderful to see this tool. So um, there will be information coming out uh, to the attendees. Um, recording will be available. And again, even for people who weren't able to register today, the recording will eventually be available uh, for on this three website. So um, thank you so much, Mariel and Don. It was really great to have you and your expertise. Um, and just uh, come join us. We'll um, stay tuned for more methods, webinars, uh, and maybe follow-ups on, on Bayesian methods in particular and Bayesian. So um, thank you all so much and uh, have a great rest of the day. Thank you, Liz. I hope okay. to see you in person again someday. <laughs> I hope so too. <laughs> Bye everybody, thanks so much. Thank you.